Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's delightful to welcome so many of you here to this first um, seminar from CELS, the Centre for European Legal Studies here at Cambridge. And I'm particularly delighted uh, to welcome um, as our guest, David Gork, uh, who's incredibly well known to all of us. Now, it's usual in these circumstances to read off an extensive biography, but actually I think you'd be more interested to hear him talk than me. But I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, he, of course, was uh, a marvellous Lord Chancellor, and lots of people have always said he was a Lord Chancellor Law Officer who took his job incredibly seriously and was deeply popular because he took the job so seriously. But he's also a man with a very fine sense of humour. If you follow him on Twitter, he probably will make your day. Indeed, uh, one of the first tweets I ever saw from David was him in a very nice swimming pool with a very large unicorn floating behind him. And um, which was, of course, coincided with one of the many um, peaks and troughs of the Brexit debate. And indeed, today he has helpfully pointed out that the time has come for Boris Johnson to perhaps write two columns. Now, um, David's very kindly going to talk for 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions. If you have questions for him, would you be so kind as to put them in the Q&A box? And Marcus Gehring and I will have a look at those questions as they're coming in and try and get as many questions as we can to David. So David, first of all, many, many thanks for your time. Hugely grateful to you. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Catherine. A great pleasure to be here. And um, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending, if that's the right word, um, this, uh, th this seminar. Um, I, before turning to where we are now in the negotiations and, and speculating on what is going to happen next, I, I think it might be helpful just to put all of this in, in some context. Um, because it seems to me that the, the story of Brexit over the last four years uh, needs to be understood uh, going back to uh, the time of Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister and the tension, not just within the Conservative Party, but if you like within um, the sort of Thatcherite part of the Conservative Party that has never properly resolved itself between, on the one hand, the internationalist, free trading, economically liberal, uh, pro-business uh, part of uh, Thatcherism, if you like, the, 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 that delivered us the single market under Arthur Cofield, uh, that did much to reform the UK economy, to welcome foreign direct investment and so on, with at the same time a more nationalist, um, suspicious of the outside world and outside interference, uh, a, a view that places much greater priority on sovereignty and regulatory autonomy. And, and clearly those two instincts, both of which um, existed within Margaret Thatcher herself, are in tension with each other. But for a very long time, there hasn't really been that recognition of the, of the tension between those instincts or, or, on part, in parts of the Conservative Party uh, in particular. And, and that has been a cause of all sorts of problems. And, and I would identify, if you like, four failures of understanding that, that, has, that has occurred, generally amongst those who have uh, been on the Eurosceptic side of the argument, but not exclusively, that have led to us being in the very difficult position that we have been for the last uh, few years, really, since the, 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 the referendum result. There is that, first of all, that failure to recognise the tension between uh, being a free trading internationalist country and, and wanting to have regulatory uh, autonomy. Second, I think there has been a failure to understand EU thinking in this area. Uh, third, I think, has been a failure to understand the relative negotiating strengths, the weight, uh, if you like, on, uh, between the two, two sides, the EU and the UK. 
Uh, and fourth, and I'm not going to dwell on this, although this, this point has been absolutely vital to the history of Brexit, has been the uh, impact of this debate on Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland uh, and the implications for the border on the island of Ireland. And I think a failure to understand all those points uh, has you know, resulted in, first of all, the Brexit vote, and then the fact that we have run into the difficulties that we have in terms of reaching a deal and why this, why this process has been much, much more difficult than many people would have believed in 2016. Um, first of all, just returning to this, this tension between internationalism and free trade uh, and, and sovereignty, um, one of the reasons why I think there has been this failure to understand what is on the face of it, something that is perfectly straightforward and obvious, is because we go back to, to Margaret Thatcher, who was seen as this great figure for bringing down trade barriers. She was a voice for economic liberalism, but she was also uh, a, a voice for sovereignty. And the debate of the 1980s, if you like, the point at which modern Euroscepticism was born was at the time of the Delors agenda, uh, which was about a more interventionist European community as it then was. It was about the EU or EC as it was, um, intervening in environmental issues and social issues. And you, know, you have the Bruges speech in 1988, where Margaret Thatcher you know, talks about, you know, essentially you should roll back the frontiers of the state to have them reimposed at a European level. And, and Euroscepticism at that point was born as a sort of free market, or was remade as a sort of free market, uh, free trading, uh, dogma, if you like, an ideology. Um, and uh, that quite powerful argument um, had very significant appeal within the Conservative Party. I think you also have to play in that the other battle going on between the sort of Delors interventionist um, a, approach, which which the Labour Party, of course, adopted and, and you know, welcomed Delors to um, TUC conference and, 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 and what have you. Uh, you also had the debate going on at the same time about Britain's membership of the ERM and ultimately Britain's membership of the Euro, the single currency. Where again, the sort of Thatcherite position was skeptical about the ERM and strongly opposed to the UK joining uh, the Euro. And I think history pretty well vindicates that position, um, that, that, uh, that it was right that we uh, stayed out of the Euro and joining the ERM, I think history relates, was a, was a mistake. Uh, and there were very significant consequences uh, for that. So you had a sort of boost in the intellectual confidence of Euroscepticism, who were very much a minority view. The establishment position was we should join the ERM, and perhaps not quite so strongly, but still the establishment position was that it was inevitable that the UK was going to join the Euro. So that, that uh, on that side of the argument, I think the, 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 the Eurosceptics were vindicated and on the right side, and that gave them a great deal of confidence. I also think that one of the reasons why there was a failure to understand uh, the sort of trade-offs here is that there was a very simplistic view of, of what free trade was about, that it was simply about uh, tariffs and quotas, and that's relatively simple, and you just sort that out. And frankly, the EU wasn't terribly enthusiastic, it, it was claimed, about bringing down tariff barriers with the rest of the world that we were protecting Italian shoemakers and what have you uh, and there was a sort of sense that, that the EU was holding us back from going out and getting trade deals with the rest of the world. Now there's lots of reasons why that view was flawed but I think it was sincere that you know, there wasn't a real understanding of what trade really meant and, and what free trade and making progress on free trade uh, really meant. And I think you can make a contrast with the position in the European Union. That brings me to the sort of second failure. 
which is uh, the failure to understand the European Union's uh, attachment to the single market and the single market governed by rules. Uh, and and you know, the essence of the single market is you know, we will bring down our trade barriers with other countries, but those countries have to comply with similar rules. We will not have unfair competition. We will have rules that will protect us from that. But essentially, this is a way in which we can bring down trade barriers. And again, remembering that, you know, for a sophisticated economy, uh, more than half the cost of trade barriers tends to be non-tariff barriers. And you do need to have some kind of coordination on the rules, the no those non-tariff barrier rules and regulations. Uh, and the European Union, properly understood that and, and that is very much at the heart of the EU's approach and they consider the single market to be vital to their uh, economies and they believe that the single market um, has to be backed up by those rules that protect from unfair competition uh, and that commitment has been something that has been underestimated not just you know, recently, and not just in truth by Brexiteers, I think that commitment was underappreciated, underestimated by David Cameron when he sought to renegotiate our um, terms of membership in advance of the uh, referendum. He sought to change the rules in terms of freedom of movement. Um, the EU take a you know, pretty theological view about those four freedoms being strongly interlinked. Uh, and freedom of movement of labor was, or, or people was not something that they were prepared to concede. And that came as a surprise. In truth, it shouldn't have done. But again, you know, we are surprised and we have been surprised many times since um, that uh, the EU really committed to this. I think at times they take it um, too far. I, when I was uh, Lord Chancellor and Catherine, thank you for your kind remarks uh, uh, about that. One of the things that we were trying to do in our negotiations was make progress on civil judicial cooperation, something that predated the single market, something that was clearly to the advantage of both the UK and the European Union as a whole. But the EU took a pretty theological view that civil judicial cooperation was something that was now part of the single market and that therefore we shouldn't make concessions or they shouldn't make concessions on that particular area. That was how they, they, they viewed it. So we have not, I think, ever really understood how strongly committed they were to that. Um, and related to that, given how strongly they felt about it, um, we have, I think, consistently overestimated our negotiating strength. Uh, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say that. I'd love to be able to say that you know, we can have, get our way, but you know, we are 60, 65 million people. They are you know, 490 million people. Um, yes, they sell more to us than we sell to them, but as fractions of their economy, you know, it, is, it is significantly more important to us. Uh, our trade with the EU than it is uh, to, than, the, than, 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 than our businesses to them. And that, sadly, regrettably, is the real world that we've had to live in. And that's, again, not been a point that I think people have been willing to take on board. Uh, and, and then the fourth failure to mention is, is this issue of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and you know, in a world where we say, right, we are going to depart from the European Union to the extent that there has to be a border between uh, Great Britain and continental Europe. Um, but we also say that there can't be a border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland because that undermines the Union of the United Kingdom. And we also say that there can't be a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, because that raises issues to do with the Northern Irish peace process and the Good Friday Agreement or Belfast Agreement. Uh, and then we also say that you can't have a border between the Republic of Ireland and continental Europe because the Republic of Ireland is part of the European Union and it, it hasn't voted to leave the European Union. And you've been faced with this logical conundrum and uh, finding a way to solve that has been immensely difficult and not everybody engaged in this process has 
in truth, been prepared to engage in this question. Uh, and and that, that was a huge difficulty for Theresa May uh, when she was in office. Uh, and I think one could say that, you know, all these tricky issues, all these, I think, failures to appreciate the real world, the situation that we're in, the United Kingdom has gone through a very painful learning process over the last four and a half years, which has left us in the position that we're in. You know, remember after the referendum, people were saying that we could have all the same benefits of EU membership. We'd still be able to have that uh, uh, access to EU markets in much the same way as we had before. But we'd also have complete regulatory autonomy. Uh, and, and that was never possible. And that, that offer that was made, if you like, that was the, that was the offer put to the British people in the 2016 referendum. It, it was a view that was maintained you know, afterwards uh, by many of those who were Brexiteers who were now in government. Uh, it was David Davis, after all, who said, you know, we'll have the exact same benefits. Um, all of that was something that was never going to be delivered. I think for the most part, um, people believed that they thought they'd be able to get those things because I don't think they had appreciated the points that I'd, I had particularly run through. But there was always going to be a trade-off between regulatory autonomy and access to European markets. And you know, many people have been extraordinarily slow, I believe, in, in recognising that. Then you throw in the complications of the Northern Irish border. Uh, and what you were faced with, and what Theresa as Prime Minister was faced with, was that there was no conceivable, negotiable, logical deal that could be reached with the European Union that would satisfy uh, those who had, many of those who had campaigned for Brexit, because there wasn't a willingness from those who had campaigned and supported Brexit to, to face up to some of those hard realities. Uh, and particularly when you had the, the leaders of those campaigns, you know, unwilling to accept compromise positions, as we saw after the Chequers uh, proposal was put forth, there was much wrong with that Chequers proposal and you know, whether it was ever really viable. Uh, is is you know an interesting point, but it was a genuine attempt to try to find a way through this approach, through, through this challenge of of wanting regulatory autonomy and also wanting to uh, 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 have, maintain access to European markets. Uh, the unwillingness to engage with some of those inconvenient truths. Uh, meant that uh, the, the, the leading Brexiteers were never satisfied with any deal that Theresa was able to get, that they voted down uh, the deal on a number of occasions. Um, those, the numbers voting against diminished over, over time because they feared that they might lose Brexit altogether. But there was no winning of hearts and minds uh, amongst uh, those Brexiteers that they maintained that, that strong position. And you know, we, we ended up with her losing office. Uh, Boris Johnson coming in, essentially promising again that you can get everything, that you know, we'll, we'll defeat the doomsters and gloomsters and we'll get a fabulous deal. Uh, he eventually gets a deal, but essentially surrenders on Northern Ireland. Uh, so he goes back to the position that the EU had offered uh, back in February uh, 2018, which is essentially uh, a, a Canada-style agreement with level playing field provisions. They were always there. Uh, but that was for Great Britain. Northern Ireland uh, would essentially remain within the EU uh, customs zone. So he gets his deal. Uh, the oven-ready deal, the withdrawal agreement, but that doesn't deal then with the longer-term uh, relationship about what is going to happen uh, going forward. And, and, and you know, where we have got to now is we're still left with this sort of fundamental problem that any deal uh, is going to disappoint uh, those people who listen to the promises that were made by vote leave in 2016 and wish to judge on that basis. So can you deliver a Brexit that uh, keeps the Union together, keeps Northern Ireland and Great Britain 
essentially together? Can you deliver a Brexit which is good for business, maintaining good access to European markets? Can you deliver a Brexit that gives us the sort of regulatory sovereignty, the autonomy that, um, that was promised? And the answer is that you, you can't. Uh, you can't do that. You are going to have to find some compromises. Um, we've had the threat to walk away from what's already been agreed on, on Northern Ireland, but let's assume that, that if a deal is reached, uh, that uh, that will be put to one side. So you will have Northern Ireland in a different position from Great Britain. And the more we diverge, the bigger that issue will be. For business, this is going to be a very thin deal if a deal is reached. It'll be a very thin deal, nothing for services, still disruption at the border for goods, difficult for complex supply chains. Yes, if we reach a deal, zero tariffs and zero quotas, but I come back to what I was saying earlier about how important non-tariff barriers are and those non-tariff barriers are going to be there. So you know, bad for business compared to what we have, the, 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 the status quo. And on sovereignty, I mean, look, this, if we have a deal, it will be a very hard Brexit. Um, but if you really, really want to sort of pick a fight on this, and we know that people like Nigel Farage will, you will be able to say, well, we have signed up to certain provisions not to compete on, um, on a social and environmental, and you know, the outstanding issue is state aid. It is, to my mind, bizarre that a Conservative government wishes to make a fight on uh, having the freedom to subsidise loss-making businesses, but uh, that seems to be the issue that is uh, now at the heart of this. Um, but if we get a deal, you know, the reality is we are going to have to make some further concessions on this. I don't really see it as a concession in terms of uh, from the interests of the taxpayer. I think it would be a good thing that we had a robust and independent uh, state aid uh, regulator that prevented the government uh, wasting taxpayers' money. Uh, but nonetheless, this doesn't fit with the narrative of a sort of pure Brexit sovereignty uh, view of things. And you can see that um, the Brexit part, the former Brexit party MEPs are already gearing up to cry betrayal if there is a compromise. So we are left, or Boris Johnson is left, with a difficult choice. He has got two options, really. Uh, he can get a deal. Even at this late stage, I think a deal is possible. Uh, the fact that Michel Barnier has said this afternoon that they're, you know, they're prepared to negotiate over legal texts, that in a way is a, is a concession. You, the, the, the UK government can claim a victory there, but the last few days have really all been about the theatrics. Uh, it's all been really about um, you know, both sides wanting to, to demonstrate they're tough. Uh, as everybody says, and you know, no doubt everyone listening to this webinar has heard a hundred times, you know, we have the two outstanding issues, um, three if you count governance, but essentially state aid and fish. Um, I tend to buy the view that state aid, uh, that fish is in the end something that will be resolved. It is such a small part of the UK's economy and the EU's economy that however difficult it might be, and politically it is, they the, the, the just will find a, a compromise in this area. But the, the real issue is on, on, on state aid. Uh, I don't believe that the EU are just going to let us, you know, let us go and do what we want. Um, they will want reassurances that uh, we will have a robust state aid regime. The more we dig in on this issue, the more they wonder why and what we're up to. It's also case the, the case that um, the internal market bill has damaged trust uh, between the parties. So that, that is also uh, an issue and they will want to nail down uh, any provisions there and have strong governance to properly enforce whatever um, is agreed. But ultimately, this comes down to a decision for the Prime Minister. Does he conclude uh, that better to get a deal that, um, although there'll be disruption, there'll be less disruption, uh, that failing to reach a deal will be portrayed as incompetence, uh, that it will be a political failure at this point, um, and therefore he needs to uh, to concede on this particular point, 
or does he feel that in fact that opens up vulnerability from the other side you know, he'll be criticized for the thinness of the deal from from the labor party and some business groups uh, but he could also be criticized uh, by Nigel Farage for conceding on state aid and whatever it might be that there'll be Brexit purists out there. Uh, Recognising that if he gets a deal, he's going to get, have to go out there and sell it and he'll no doubt declare it's a fabulous victory and a great triumph. But then he'll have to live with the consequences and uh, he'll be held to account. Whereas if he doesn't get a deal, he'll be able to blame EU intransigence and say it was all their fault and I tried everything. And, and to some extent, uh, amongst many in the electorate, he'll be able to escape responsibility. He'll be able to say, well, I tried my best to get a deal. I, I was reasonable here, but you know, the EU, you just can't deal with them. They're just so insistent on having it their way. That's why we have to get out of this organization. Um, politically, I suspect in the short term, that is the easier option for him. But in the longer term, the consequences will be pretty serious. And uh, if we don't get a deal, I think it will be acrimonious. I think it'll be hard to rebuild our relationship with the EU in the short term. Uh, and that will have real world implications uh, for businesses, for livelihoods, and so on. So I very much hope that he does decide to get a deal, but I think it's quite finely balanced. And uh, Catherine, you made reference uh, earlier, I, I, I was um, tweeting, Robert Peston had a very interesting piece, talked to a number 10 inside who said, look, we, I don't think, we, do, we don't know because I don't think the Prime Minister has yet made up his mind. He is in two minds as to what he's going to do. So my suggestion was that he, he write two columns and uh, see which one he finds most persuasive. Uh, and I don't know what the answer to that is. I think it's pretty finely balanced. I've always been a bit of a pessimist on this because I've always wondered whether the Prime Minister would really want to take responsibility for a deal, because um, you know, he would then have to go out and sell it. And uh, as I say, that is not the deal that many people who voted Brexit or many people who campaigned for Brexit thought they were gonna get back in 2016. Uh, so I lean ever so slightly towards him plumping for no deal. But I guess we will know in the next week or two. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, some questions are coming in. I will give um, uh, the audience a chance to put some more questions in the Q&A. But I wonder if I could just start with a very basic question. Did the Brexiters who were advocating leave and ran uh, the Vote Leave campaign, did they actually understand EU law? Uh, I, I'm not sure that they did. I mean, you know, there, there's there's a slight risk in sort of characterising everybody in, in the same way. Um, but I, I think, you know, whether it was EU law or, or, or EU policy, I mean, I think that, you know, come back to that sort of driving force that the EU is a rules-based organisation. It believes it has to be a rules-based organisation when you when you've got 28 members as it then had um uh, at 27 now and uh, yeah, that sense that um it is only on the basis of rules which are enforced and respected that you can have the buy-in towards bringing down trade barriers um the trade barriers in some cases you just require rules to provide clarity um, but in other cases, you require rules to protect from what is seen as unfair competition. And if you don't have protection against unfair competition, you just won't have the political buy-in for a, a project that is essentially about bringing down trade barriers. And I, I, I think that that concept uh, and that sort of viewpoint wasn't properly understood. Um, I, I, and look, I think, you know, I think, I think, in all honesty, you know, some of us who were campaigning for Remain didn't fully understand it uh, in the way that we maybe now do. Um, uh, and, um, you know, quite, quite what drives the, the, the EU and why it operates in the way that it operates. Uh, I don't think there was, there was sort of widespread understanding of that amongst the, the British political class. 
And would, if Theresa May had got a deal through Parliament on one of those three um, nail-biting uh, evenings, would her deal have stuck? Or would she have been kicked out anyway and we'd be back where we are now? Um, I think there was a risk of, of that. Um, what, for, for, for those of us, you know, in all honesty, for those of us who wanted um, you know, what we would see as a sort of pragmatic, uh, uh, close relationship, particularly economically with the European Union. Um, one thing that um, you know, was, was, was widely criticised, but was actually quite important here, was the backstop, the Northern Ireland backstop. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why uh, the likes of the ERG um, loathe the backstop so much, because they could live with most things if they thought, well, yeah, let's get this agreement through and then if we down the line replace Theresa May with somebody else, then when it comes to the, you know, the future relationship, we can negotiate the type of agree agreement that we want. You know, we, can, we can just play a waiting game, get the withdrawal agreement out of the way, we will have left the EU, that'll be very hard ever to reverse, and then we can sort out our relationship in the future. But the problem for them of the backstop meant that the fact they they couldn't be sure that they would ever be able to do that because he was still left with the Northern Ireland border. Uh, and unless you have confidence that you would be able to you know, make use of alternative arrangements, you know, whatever, it, whatever they might be on the Northern Ireland border, um, the ERG feared that they were going to be traps. And in all honesty, to some extent, for those of us who wanted trade with the EU to be frictionless or as close to frictionless as possible, the Northern Ireland backstop was a guarantee that that was going to be able to carry on. Um, so, so in 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 that sense, had had the May deal got through with the Northern Ireland backstop, um, it was it was it was maybe not watertight, but there were reasons to believe it was still going to be there for some time. Thank you. I'm going to come to the question. There's loads have come in, as you would expect. But just building on the um, Theresa May issue, Adam Faraday asks, um, does David Gould believe that the, the Theresa May ministry could have played its hand any better than it did, or was it inevitable once the UK voted to leave on the basis of both these arguments, things would turn out as messily as they have? Uh, I, I think there was a point of inevitability. It wasn't quite the point where we voted to leave, um, or, although I, you know, it was always going to be difficult. I think the point where she had lost her majority um, was the point where I, I think it was pretty well inevitable that it was going to end up in a very, very messy way. I mean, I, you, know, you always hoped that that wasn't going to be the case, but I, you know, I can remember sort of waking up and whatever that Friday morning was um, in, in June, in 2017 thinking I don't really see a way through here um, and I think that um, yeah I think that was that was the, that was the point where it was almost impossible I mean I, the other point where you know I remember being sort of very depressed by it all uh, was, was was after the collapse of the checkers idea uh, and uh, David and Boris resigning from the cabinet David Davis and, and, uh, and Boris Johnson resigning from the cabinet. I, I think that point as well sort of demonstrated quite how, um, in my view, unmanageable the Conservative Party was uh, by that point and how unwilling the leadership of, of most of the leadership of the, of the Leave campaign was to kind of face up to what I felt were the hard choices and the real trade-offs that were going to be made, with, with the honourable exception of Michael Gove, I have to say. Um, but, you know, by and large, they weren't prepared to face up to that. Uh, and so I think that, you know, if you can, if you can make something even more inevitable, uh, that made it even more inevitable. Uh, but, but, yeah, so I think, um, you know, we, we, we're always going to be faced with the, the reality of, uh, of incompatible claims, if you like, incompatible objectives from, from, from the Leave camp. Um, but once you know, once you'd sort of stripped her of a, of a parliamentary majority, um, you know, I think you know, with a parliamentary majority, if her reputation and, and, and the political capital that that might have bestowed, she might have been able to you know, force through a relatively soft Brexit. 
uh, at that point. Thank you. Just um, Estelle um, Walfords um, asked, going back earlier than the backstop, do you think that there was originally expect an expectation that Ireland would be swept along with the UK and leave the EU with the UK such the Irish border issue wouldn't arise? Or was Northern Ireland not considered at all? Um, I mean, there might have been some people who, you know, in their, in, in their sort of wildest dreams would have thought that that could have happened. I, d I, don't, I don't think anybody serious in government, as far as I was aware, ever thought that, that, that the Republic of Ireland would, would, um, would, would just sort of you know, join us, that there would be an Irish exit from the EU um, a, a, as well. Um, I, I think there was just, um, if you like, a dismissal of the issue of, uh, oh, it'll all be fine. Oh, it's just Remainers creating difficulties. Oh, they're, they're, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, oh, technology will be able to sort all this out. I, I'm sure it'll be fine. That was essentially it. Not engaging in the details, just, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. This is just a sort of bureaucratic nonsense. These problems could always be sort, sorted, uh, and that was that was the that was the mindset. I, I honestly don't think there was anybody um, at, at serious levels. I'm sure I'm sure you can find some conservative backbenchers who, you know, after after a drink or two in the smoking room, would be able to say, "Oh, well, of course, you know, it's ridiculous. They should just join us." Um, I, I personally never heard that, but I wouldn't be surprised if if, if that was said. But I, you know, I, I don't think anybody. In a position of seniority, we ever believe that. Uh, Patrick Elias asks, given your view that no good deal was really ever possible, and this was presumably obvious to Theresa May, why did she take such a blinkered view that she would not push for a second referendum, particularly she felt that the true position had never properly been disclosed to the British public? Was she taking the politically easy option? No, I think it was. Um... It was sincere. I mean, it was just to explain my own position. I mean, for a long, um, you know, for a long time, my view was um, that we should try to find a kind of you know, least worst option, a sort of, you know, a, a pretty soft Brexit view. And, and I, you know, I think there are real downsides in in not implementing a referendum result. Um, uh, and uh, I, you know, in the end, I reluctantly came to the view that the choice was uh, become so polarised that it wasn't possible to deliver um, a soft Brexit uh, that, that had you know, relatively limited economic harm, um, that I, I believe it was polarised between a, a very hard Brexit, quite possibly a no-deal Brexit, um, or, or staying in. And in those circumstances, I came to the view that it would be better to have a second referendum. Um, and you know, that, uh, and I, I regret that we we haven't uh, had a second referendum. But I think it's completely reasonable to believe that um, you know one should try to implement that referendum result. Uh, and uh, you know, she she was she sincerely wanted to do that. I think she felt it would have undermined trust in democracy. Um, I, I'm not completely, I'm not being naive, I'm not the scout that, you know, it, was a, it would have been an impossible thing for the Conservative Party as well um, to, to have another referendum. But, uh, but I think she was sincere. Uh, I mean, there was, a, there was a point where I had a conversation with her, I think in what, it must have been around February of, um, of, of 2019, uh, where I said, I think, look, you know, put your deal, you know, get, get your deal through the House of Commons by accepting a, a referendum on it. But you know, she, she, she wasn't, she wasn't having it. I mean, I, I would have, I'd have felt somewhat conflicted because I'm, I would have, um, you know, I felt duty bound, I think, to have campaigned to remain if there'd been a second referendum. But um, uh, and we've had to resign from the from the government. But I, I, um, but you know, I did think that. Uh, yeah, there was a point by the time um, uh, you know, we were sort of losing votes. So I've got my chronology wrong. Maybe actually it was um, maybe it was February 2019. Actually, yeah. But uh, I think I would have. Um, you know, by the time we were losing votes in that way, I, I think you know, things were looking pretty desperate. 
Thank you. Um, I've, um, Matthew Banks um, asks, would you agree that one of our main problems with Europe is one of identity, that the UK has never fully embraced membership? We seem to always use language of us and them. I've greatly enjoyed your talk, he says, but even your language is full of us and them, them being 27, us being one. As a result, our negotiations are always flawed because we do not truly see, see ourselves as European. I think that's true. I mean, to, to be fair, you know, when I say them and us, you know, that's where we are now. We are 27 and one, and we 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 have left. And you know, since 2016, we have, uh, you know, there's been a mandate for us to leave. So it has become uh, very much a, a, a them and us. And certainly, the negotiations now are, are, are of that um, uh, uh, nature. And uh, and I, I know, in fact, on Twitter, I'm used to being accused of being a sort of you know. EU shill, so um, so that sort of uh, 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 makes a change. But yeah, I, I think that's right. And, and, and the, the UK never really um, uh, bought into the European projects in, in, in the way that, that many of the politicians, at least many of the political classes of uh, of, of the EU, of other EU member states, have, have done, and to some extent. You know, to a much greater extent than this country, the, the, the people of those EU member states as well. So um, th that is true. And, and I, I speak as someone who doesn't, you know, I haven't come to this um, from a sort of deep ideological sort of romantic view of the European Union. You know, when I entered Parliament in, in you know, 2005, I saw myself very much as a, as a, as a Eurosceptic. And it was, it was more on the kind of pragmatic issues of you know how do you keep trade barriers down um that, that caused me to change my position if you like um but no there, there's not been that romantic attachment if, if that's the right word but you know ideological idealistic um attachment to to the project within within the uk and it always struck me that the best argument that the leavers had which actually was not one really that they particularly made it was is look there's the you know, the, it's not so much about now, but it's the long-term destination of the European Union. They're ultimately going in to create a much closer relationship than we'll ever feel comfortable uh, within. And you know, we should get out now on friendly terms, but um, that's where we should go. That always struck me as 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 as, as a much more sensible argument than many of the arguments we did hear from them. Um, but no, it's, it, it it is right. There isn't that strong attachment within the UK. Uh, and, and and maybe maybe it was always inevitable that you know, something like, something like this was going to happen. Building on that, uh, Richard Barfield asks, why do you think Brexit became a, or has become a religious war with both sides of politicians talking past each other? Yeah, good question. I think um, I think partly. I mean, on the on the you know, on the the long list of 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 things that we know now. That we didn't know then, and I, you know, I talked through about a few of those. Is is one how divisive a referendum can be? Um, that you know, one, uh, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be people listening to this saying, "Well, you should have known that in the first place," and, and maybe that's fair. Um, but the uh, you know, the bitterness that came from the referendum campaign um, was immense. Uh, I, I think social media makes it worse. Um, uh, I, I think you, you, we have become very tribal about this and um, each side can hear what the other side is saying about them. So, you know, one, one side thinks that, you know, the other lot think that they're all racists, racists and bigots and, you know, the other side thinks that the other, you know, the other side thinks that they're all, you know, aloof metropolitan, um, uh, you know, arrogant types. And and the longer it went on, particularly as there was this great, you know, impasse that we we went through in in twenty nineteen, uh, the 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 more bitter it became. Um, and to some extent, you know, people were talking about different things. You know, for some people were talking about economics and. Others were talking about uh, you know, culture and, and a sort of sense of you know, the nation changing much faster and that their views weren't 
really being understood and respected. So it has become an enormously bitter process. And I don't think that that's going to disappear very quickly. You know, I don't think it's going to heal very easily. Um, I mean, to some extent, you know, because COVID has so dominated 2020, we've talked a lot less about Brexit, but whatever, wherever we go in this, however we finally resolve it, we're going to be talking about Brexit very considerably over the next few months. And, you know, there's a point, I mean, you know, just think how, uh, you know, live an issue, the Iraq war continues to be and how it excites, you know, great feelings. Uh, that was 17 years ago. Um, for the vast, vast, vast majority of people in this country, they weren't directly affected. Um, obviously, there were families that sadly you know, lost loved ones, but you know, for the vast majority of us, there was no direct impact. Uh, and yet, it's still very much a, a live issue, and people feel very, very strongly about it. And, and I think that's going to carry on with Brexit, I'm afraid. And and of course, Brexit is, it, you know, it isn't just an event, you know, there's a process and the nature of our relationship with the European Union, our closest trading partner is going to be a huge issue in British politics forever. Um, you know, absolutely forever. That's not going to go away. What do you think would have happened if the 2019 general election hadn't taken place? A uh, really good question. Um, I mean, you're still, you're still left with the Corbyn conundrum. So you had people like me who would have been willing to serve in a national government, but not in a national government led by Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and, you know, we would have, you know, if, if there'd been a sort of short term fix of bring you know, everyone together and take a bill through for a second referendum and you know, do the sort of Theresa May deal um, versus uh, Remain, um, there might, you know, we probably weren't very far away from a parliamentary majority for that by the end. Um, but you're still left with this problem. There was no parliamentary majority for a government led by Jeremy Corbyn. Um, uh, and then, of course, I mean, you know, we, what no one could have anticipated is, is, is COVID came along. So, you know, it's hard to see that we could have had a general election in 2020. Um, so, and, and indeed, these would have been exactly the circumstances where you would probably want a, um, a, 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 a national government. So, I mean, my, 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 my sense, you know, the really interesting question is what would have happened had um, there not been a general election and had Jeremy Corbyn not been the leader of the Labour Party? I suppose that's a, it's an easier answer. I think, you know, if, if Keir Starmer had been leading the Labour Party this time, uh, last year, I, I think I think a national government would have been formed. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end of time, but there's some other good questions here, so I just want to flag them up. Pedro Schilling uh, de uh, Carvalho says, "Thank you for your presentation. Any take on financial services, considering the lack of any substantive agreement during the June deadline, reluctance that the EU has shown in considering equivalent decisions, showing in considering equivalent decisions." Um, yeah, briefly on this one, look, whether there's a deal or no deal, there's nothing very much there for financial services. You know, there's some equivalents uh, for 18 months or so on clearing, uh, but nothing much else. Um, so I think from the 1st of January, you know, we were kind of very much in a sort of post-EU, uh, no equivalents world. Uh, the difference, I think, is that you know, if there is a deal, then it is possible that things like equivalents for financial services could be built up again um potentially reasonably quickly um uh, so so i think you know it, we could we could see things uh, in future recover to some extent but uh, deal or no deal for the time being there's not going to be very much for financial services at all um what kind of state is the UK going to be? I imagine the questioner has in mind particularly the internal market bill, but perhaps more widely. Um, I think it's really, it, it's, it's going to be a crucial decision this, that, that Boris Johnson makes, because is he going to, um, if he decides not to compromise on state aid, then I think he is committing the Conservative Party to a particular trajectory and therefore frankly the British state to a particular trajectory 
uh, he will, it will be an acrimonious departure. He will blame the European Union for every problem that occurs from here on in. Um, he will seek to uh, maintain that Leave coalition support that he achieved in 2019. Uh, he will be very focused on those red wall seats. He'll be slashing the cash uh, to help in those areas. But I think he will also have to have an agenda which is all about the culture wars. Um, and it will be you know, very nationalist, if you like, anti-establishment, very unconservative government if he goes down that route. Um, if, however, uh, he goes for a deal, uh, then I think he's on a different trajectory. Um, and although I think there'll still be a bit of that, and he'll still want to keep hold of those red wall seats, um, I think there'll also be a, it'll be a more balanced picture um but but yeah there are some strongly anti-establishment voices in number 10 uh and, and I, I worry the direction that they take the country in terms of attitude to the civil service to the rule of law uh, uh, uh to some extent to the media and the bbc um and it's a sort of very aggressive uh potentially populist uh and nationalist government um Robert Moore says, you say correctly in my view that the EU is likely to become something that would be unacceptable to the UK. Where do you think the EU is actually heading? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, without the UK, it is possible that the EU will integrate much more rapidly than they otherwise would have done. I, I think in, in truth, the Eurozone, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of the euro, but I think the eurozone re requires closer integration. Um, so they probably are heading in in, in that general that general direction. Um, you you can argue that the world is is forming you know, more adversarial trading blocks, and that again forces uh, the EU together. Although um, assuming that the that Joe Biden wins the American presidency, that might change the dynamic. Um, but a lot of these things are, you know, when it comes to sort of close integration, they are quite hard to do. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a done deal that in five years time that the EU will be much, much deeper than it currently is. Um, it is it is fraying a bit in the edges in terms of, you know, how does it deal with the likes of Hungary and, and to some extent Poland. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little cautious about predicting where they're going, but, but I assume that the you know, post-UK, that the EU will perhaps have a little bit more momentum to, to, to place integration. Uh, one, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, regulatory divergence, will we do it and in what areas? Um, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I think, I, 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 I think um, it's not clear to me where the areas where we will look to diverge um, massively. So again, coming back to financial services, you know, one issue there is uh, ESG and you know, the EU have got you know, lots of regulations they want to do in, in that area. But I can't see the UK wanting to sort of distinguish itself um, uh, by, by by taking a deregulatory approach to that. And indeed, what you know, the Treasury is saying that they want to be at the forefront of these things. Um, I, I think one of the problems for Brexiteers has been to identify you know, where the great regulatory gains are, where are the regulations that we could, uh, um, that we, we can make. So um, I, I'm sure they will want to demonstrate some divergence in some areas. But again, we come back to that trade-off you know, what that, that, that trade-off, you want market access, the more you um, uh, diverge, the harder it's going to be. You've also got the issue with Northern Ireland. The more you diverge with Great Britain, the, the greater the divide with Northern Ireland. Last question, um, which may um, pose a challenge for you, um, is um, Matthew Banks asks, what are your feelings on the current incumbent of your previous position? Is it something you consider allowable that the position has become increasingly political? Do you consider, based on the orthodox understanding of the role, that any individual could do the role with this current government's rhetoric? Um, well, one I would say is 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 this. I mean, first of all, I think um, you know, 
Uh, my successor, Robert Buckland, I think is 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 a really good guy, um, and you know he really uh, does care about the, the the law and the rule of law. What I would say, I have said this in the past, is that um, if the government in which you know if, if in my time as Lord Chancellor, uh, the Prime Minister had insisted on putting forth something like the Internal Market Bill, which obviously blatantly um breaches international law uh, i would have advised against doing that and if that advice had not been taken um i would have resigned from the government um and uh, obviously robert has taken a different different approach on that note we have just come to the end of our time can i thank you warmly for your fantastic uh, contribution thanks so much for speaking so uh, frankly, so clearly, and actually putting quite a lot of this into context. We're really very grateful to you. Thank you too for the excellent questions from um, our wonderful audience. Um, for those of you who are interested in hearing more, um, Martin Dunn is talking tomorrow on how to negotiate a trade deal, something that we may have something to learn from. And then on Wednesday, Anu Bradford is going to talk about the Brussels effect, which ties in very neatly with what David's been saying about the fact that um, even once we're outside the um, EU, of course, we'll still be in the EU's orbit. And if we want to sell any goods into the EU single market, we're going to have to respect uh, EU rules, um, which is something else that at no stage, I recall, did anyone say in the context of the referendum. So um, plenty to talk about later on, but thank you, David, for your time. I'm hugely grateful to you and good luck with your new job. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, lovely to see you. And thank you to our audience.